Trash, part two, chapter three. It was raining and cool. I just kept running steadily. I had no idea where I was and I didn't care. I felt like I could run forever. I ran through the streets, heading for any lights that I saw. I had no money at all and I didn't care. The world felt so big. The rain was so fresh. And I remember thinking, why is it raining in the dry season? How can it be so cool? The sky was so high. Time had slowed right down, but it can't have been more than three hours. And as I ran, I realized more and more how stuck the police were if I was the only clue they had. Again, it was clear how important the things we'd found must be. And then I began to think how lucky I was and how close death had been. The hand could have opened and dropped me. I could have been thrown away. I could be now, right now, slowly dying on a stone floor. I closed my eyes and ran faster with my arms stretched out. My auntie had said, Raphael found something, and that was the only clue they had. Just those words had led to the whole neighborhood being searched, me being taken, taken, but free now. At last, I slowed to a walk, and at the far end of the street, I saw a landmark I knew. I didn't know its name, but I knew it was in the city business district. The landmark was the statue of a soldier raised up high. He had a drawn sword ready for some charge and some war. I had passed him before, yelling something to his comrades, fighting for freedom. I walked right up to him and looked up and I said, they let me go. I did not give it up. I could not believe they had let me go. And the statue just carried on yelling, there was a surge of rain and a kind of breeze I'd felt up on the dump site, in from the sea, a typhoon breeze, though this was not the typhoon season. I looked at the soldier and thought, so am I garbage? And I laughed because it occurred to me there and then that the garbage boy had just lied his way out from under the noses of those clever men. A little garbage boy had sat there shaking, saying, I don't have the bag when all the time I knew exactly where it was and what had been in it. We'd caught the train and we'd found the locker. We had the letter. And okay, we did not know what it all meant yet, but the garbage boys were way ahead of the garbage police. And I had said nothing to those men. I walked on. It would take two or three hours to reach Bahala, and I was so happy walking. I knew which direction to take. I passed an old man and two little kids with a cart. They were night sweepers shoveling trash. I asked the man if he had a cigarette and he looked at me strangely. I had forgotten that my face was covered in blood. He gave me a little bit of cigarette and I sat and smoked with him. The kids stood and looked at me and I was stinking, but nobody seemed to care much. The little girl was about five and the other, maybe a girl, maybe a boy, looked about seven. The seven-year-old got a bottle of water out of the cart and I splashed some over my nose and mouth. Then I said goodbye and started running again. Let me tell you something else. I think I will tell it now. On that computer we had found out about Jose, the man whose bag it was, Jose Angelico, God rest his poor soul, was a dead man. His name had been in the news. Gardo had said, what if he's a killer? But it turned out the poor man had been killed. Guess where he had died? He had died in a police station. The newspaper said he had died while the police were interrogating him. In the same police station as me? I wondered. In the same room? Had they dropped him from the window on purpose? By mistake? I was passing a little park and I ducked into it for a moment and sat on the grass. The rain was so light and cool. I guess I was in deep shock, so I just sat for a while and I thought more about poor Jose Angelico. He had been arrested on suspicion of a major, major crime. It had made all the papers. After the computer, we had gone to the papers. One thing there's a lot of on the dump site is old newspapers. It didn't take us long to find the right ones. And we sat there like three little old men, me reading it all out to Rat who nodded and stared. The police had arrested Jose Angelico for robbery. Six million dollars. We sat back and tried to imagine what even a thousand dollars looks like. Gardo tried to translate it into pesos and got a headache so bad he had to lie down. 
we were laughing, trying to imagine how you walk with all those millions of dollars in your pocket. And then we stopped laughing. Jose Angelico had died in a police station, they said, and that's why I stuck to the lie. Even as they held me out of that window, for the sake of Jose Angelico in his serious faced little girl, I also think Jose was with me because I know the dead come back. The crime he was accused of was robbing a government man, the vice president of $6 million. And maybe he'd done it and maybe the money was waiting somewhere. He must have put that bag in the trash before they got him. I think perhaps they made him confess to it and that's when they came looking. One newspaper told us a little bit about him. It said he had been an orphan, but had been adopted by a man called Dante Jerome Alondres, son of Gabriel Alondres. That was the name on the letter we'd found. Gabriel Alondres, the man in Colva prison. Jose Angelico, it said, had worked as a houseboy for the vice president for 18 years. It said that Jose Angelico had an eight-year-old daughter and no other family. That is why he was writing to Gabriel Alondres. I sat shaking in the rain, and I knew for sure now that we would have to go to Colva prison and deliver the letter.